of knowing you've done a job well and you're now off duty, but you're together with those that you work with. And that's my prayer for our time. We are together, we are in Christ, we can be real, we can have fun, we can pray, we can laugh. We can just find the encouragement that we need one with another. I've only ever been to two clergy conferences before. One was in this diocese eight conferences ago when I was a curate, and I have one memory of that. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Uh, The other was in another diocese which should remain nameless. I mean, I've spoken at some other conferences, but in terms of being on them, only two. It was in another diocese, and it was the worst conference I have ever been to in my life. So this one's going to be better. Let me pray and then I'll just say a few more things before we kick off. Holy Spirit, we ask you to fill this place. We come just as we are and we lay down the burdens that we have before you this week because we want to come simply to meet you and meet each other. When we were ordained, those words were spoken over us. You cannot bear the weight of this calling in your own strength. Pray earnestly for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we go on praying for needful gifts of grace. Lord, would you consecrate this space and this time? Would you consecrate each of us as a gift to the other? And would you open our hearts again that we can be in receiving mode as well as giving mode? Where we are dry, would you pour upon us that glorious refreshment of your kingdom. Where we find ourselves lost, would you reach out your hand, not to shove us back into line, but to embrace us back to your heart. Where where we are weary, would you breathe the breath of your spirit over us? Would you grant the gift of sleep, deep sleep? Where we are lonely, Would you give us the gift of new friends? Lord, we want every part of this conference, from the bar to the meeting room to the dining room to the croquet lawn to the space around the lake, every single part to be holy and a gift in your kingdom. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Now, I'm intrigued, just before I go on, if you've ever been to a clergy conference before, can you put your hand up? Brilliant. If you've been to two clergy conferences before, keep your hand up. Three, four, five, six, seven, it's impressive, guys, eight, nine, ten, flipping egg, eleven, <laughs> twelve, uh, I think, oh, we've got, are you both thirteen or, or are you more? Twelve. And, and was Noah a good speaker? <laughs> oh, sorry, Diane, I missed you, Diane. Right. Yeah, how many have you been to? 13. 13, brilliant. Any more than 13 in the room? Brilliant. Well, Swanick, I have to say, I think has come on amazingly. Well done, all of you, in these times. Um, if you don't know the story of Swanick, it's amazing. It's, um, it's a house that was requisitioned in the Second War. It was a prisoner of war camp. So the chapel, if you go in there, was built, the middle part of it, by German prisoners of war. It's the most amazing space that speaks of the redemption of God in the middle of, of, of where we are and who we are. So welcome in Christ's name. I do want to say thank you to various people. Um, Emma, thank you to you and the team for the work that you've done. It's been absolutely <laughs> superb job. And I want to say thank you particularly to those who will not be standing at the front on the team, because obviously those are the ones that we will notice. Thank you. Thank you to Shaman Nerf. Shaman Nerf, are you in the room? Brilliant. Can you just stand up? So um, these four are brothers and sisters from the community of Shaman Nerf, who are a community very close to my heart, and they've come to join us. They'll be leading a bit of worship, doing a couple of seminars, um, and they're also around pastorally. I'll introduce the pastoral chaplains as well in just a moment. But the great thing about Shaman Nerf is they don't report to me. (laughs) 
so if you want to talk to people completely outside the diocese but utterly godly, wise and lovely, then please talk to our friends from Shamanda. Thank you so much for joining us. And then we also have a couple of our bishop's pastoral chaplains. If you can just stand up, please, Lynn and Georgina. I'll be commissioning them later on, who are also around uh, doing chaplaincy work. Is anybody else here thinking they're doing chaplaincy work? <laughs> Brilliant. So those six are people that we particularly need uh, to thank. I don't think there's very much more that I want to say, apart from the fact that you are welcome. Have a great time. Have huge amounts of fun. My one recollection of the only previous Chester clergy conference that I have been to is playing croquet on the lawn uh, down there. Um, I think that speaks volumes, actually. We're here for fellowship. We're here to be real. We're here to meet Jesus. We're here to worship and study the scriptures. But we are here in order that we might be blessed to be a blessing. For God is good. And all the time. Bishop Sam. is an unenviable job. We've all been there, so huge thanks in advance for everything that you're doing, for the times when we don't notice you because it's working swingly, and the times uh, when we do pray for you uh, because it's not, so it's great. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let the redeemed of God share their story. From north and south, east and west. From, <coughs> from office and school, factory and field. God, God calls his people to come. From site and plant, hospital and home. God, God calls his people to come. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And so as we gather together, we remember God's call on our lives. God's call to be disciples of his son, Jesus Christ. God's call into ministry of different kinds, in chaplaincies, in schools, in parishes. Almighty God, by whose grace alone we are accepted and called to your service, strengthen us, we pray, by your Holy Spirit and make us worthy of our calling. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come, follow me. There's a pause between a question and the answer. When your heart starts beating faster, when your words get hard to master, when your doubts foretell disaster, where everything screams, I just, I can't. In that moment, no is far safer than go. It is a harbor of sorts without risk and without cost that ignores the loss of the what-ifs and the what-might-be's, you freeze. 
knees knocking at the fear of the freedom that this invitation invites. Of the light held in the promise of just what might be. But those eyes and that voice, they promise more than you could hope, more than you could dream. Come, follow me. Leave the nets which trap more than fish, that bind you to a life laid out in a plan that wasn't yours, to a path that wasn't his, for a life that has no future. Instead, to pursue the freedom that following will bring. Come, follow me. Three words which free, three words which invite me, three words which draw me into the three. And I will make you fish for people. So to leave is not to leave myself, but to bring my all, my gifts, my skills, who I am to answer this call. For to follow is not to abandon but to carry, to bring myself in service and not to tarry, to recast the net which binds to one which offers freedom to all. Come, follow me. This moment, which feels as if it has gone on for all eternity, calls me to follow into eternity, in the service of the one who crafted not simply the net, but the sea. So now I see that fear can be cast aside, that my dread of what might be must be overcome to be set free. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Come, follow me. And yet for all kinds of reasons and in all kinds of ways, we have looked down or turned aside from responding to that call on our lives. Whether out loud or by default, our response has been, I can't, I won't, I shouldn't have to. And so in this place this afternoon, we bring the reality of who we are for the reality of the one who calls us, who calls us to return, who calls us to turn, who calls us to himself. We confess to you when our fear has stopped us answering your call. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. We confess that we have followed our own path and ignored your will for our lives. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We confess that in our frailty, through neglect and through intent, we have sinned and gone astray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the grace of God's forgiveness, we find ourselves in need of Christ's restoration. As many of us gather today, we do so worn down, burdened and tired. We have carried the cost of ministering through the pandemic and the pressures of our ministry. Let us remember that we are held in the loving arms of our Saviour 
and needful of his love. From our tiredness and from our emptiness. Restore us with your love. From our grief grown from all we have lost in the pandemic. Restore us with your love. From the crushing weight of fear and anxiety. Restore us with your love. From our doubts and lack of faith, restore us with your love. O oh God, from all that weighs us down and shackles us from your love. Restore us with your love. We stand to sing.
Come have your way. Come have your way among us. Welcome you here, Lord Jesus. So come, we pray, Holy Spirit, and continue to pour yourself out. For we are yours. We love you. And we are greedy for more of you. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated for a moment. I'm going to move back to the tie clip mic. I don't know which one you've got me on. Um, I wonder whether, uh, after each of the Bible readings and possibly at other times, we can kind of keep this place as a quiet, prayerful space. Um, some of you will be wild charismatics and used to this, so you can do prayer ministry with each other. Some of you won't be, but you still like praying for each other, so that's fine. You might like to sit in silence. Um, I don't really mind what happens, but I wonder whether we can just kind of keep this place as reflective, quiet uh, place and respond to each other's needs uh, following the Bible reading. Um, it's my great privilege now, though, before we move on, to commission, well, to commission three people, but only two of them are here. So Georgina and Lynn, will you come and join me up here so that people can see you? 
And Ian Davenport is, uh, Davenport is the third person who isn't able to be with us. Um, one of the things that became very clear to me early on in my time in the diocese is that we as clergy and our friends who are in lay ministry and retired clergy and various others have a huge number of burdens upon us which can't always be met by the bishops and archdeacons going around and doing the pastoral ministry that we would like to do because life is just so busy. And yet, it's vital that we are caring for each other. So I came up with this harebrained scheme, and others seemed to think it was quite a good idea. And uh, Ian and Georgina and Lynn agreed to be part of it, just to have some bishops, pastoral chaplains that we could uh, trust and ask to go and actually spend time with people uh, in the name of the bishops and the archdeacons and others. So we're hugely grateful for you doing that. Uh, it's good to commission you here, and it's great that you can be around, and it's good that you're properly collared, unlike the bishops. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, to, to be around to listen to people. Again, there is that same expectation of confidentiality, but a de deliberate link uh, into the ministry of the diocese. So thank you hugely. Um, I'm going to ask you in a moment a question about whether you're willing to take this ministry on, which I shall make up on the spur of the moment. If you are, then if you just say something like yes, or I will, or, or what have you. Um, Andy hasn't scripted that bit, but we'll allow the spirit to guide. Is, is that all right? But the first thing is for everybody here. For there are varieties of gifts... There are varieties of service. There are different kinds of working, but the same God is at work in all. Georgina and Lynn, we are hugely grateful for the ministry which you offer. Are you willing to take on this role of Bishop's Pastoral Chaplain in the Diocese of Chester? I am. Will you be faithful to the Lord and faithful to those that you serve? I will. And will you daily seek the power of the Holy Spirit that you might minister in grace and see the coming of his kingdom? So may the Holy Spirit of the living God rest upon you with power, with grace, with gentleness, and with love, that as you minister, others might find themselves drawn to the very Father heart of God and freed in order that they might not only serve, but be served, that they might be part of the coming liberty of the kingdom of God, for we ask in your name. Amen. If this prayer appears on the screen, which may or may not, it doesn't. In which case, can you imagine you're praying it with me? God, our Father, Lord of all the world, through your Son, you have called us into the fellowship of your universal church. Hear our prayer for your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry, each may be an instrument of your love. And give to your servants, Georgina and Lynn and Ian, now to be made bishops, pastoral chaplains, the needful gifts of grace through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and all whom you serve this day and forever. Amen. Amen. Bless you and thank you in advance for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. And as we pr prepare to pray together the Lord's Prayer, so we pause to bring our own needs, concerns, fears, our own longings, hopes and desires before the God of heaven. Praying also for those whom we carry in our hearts and minds. Those who have made it possible for us to be here for these days. those situations around the globe which grieve us and which we join with the Spirit of God in intercession. That through these words our fears may be diluted and we might be drawn anew by grace and hope. In whichever version resonates most deeply for us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Draw your church together, O God, into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, together serving him in his mission to the world, together witnessing to his love, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power is at work among us can do infinitely more than all we can ask or conceive. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. So let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. For God is good. All the time. All the time. God is now, while Bishop Mark thinks of a Bible study, Emma's got some notices for us. I have. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Just bear with it. I need to get my sheet of things to say. Up, we have five pounds, which is found in the car park of Lakeside. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave it here for the rightful owner to come and reclaim. Pardon. <laughs> I've got pages of things, don't worry, it won't take that long. Um, so just a welcome from the planning team. Um, we will be giving you housekeeping as we go through the week so you know what's coming at you. There's a little bit, there's quite a lot tonight because it's the beginning of the conference. We do have a rolling screen, by the way, um, of notices and changes to venues and other things that are likely to come up as we go through the week. If anybody wants a notice on there, if there's something that you need to kind of advertise, um, do speak to Simon at the back. Um, give us a wave, Simon's on the team. So um, he's done some templates and we can just kind of point it in his direction. He'll make sure that's up on screen for us. Um, we did, as a planning committee, try very hard to make sure we were a COVID-secure event and encourage people to wear masks and stuff. But as you can see, the minute we arrive, that's gone completely out the window. Um, but, <laughs> well, yes. Um, but we... Just to be aware that we do have, we have set up the main conference hall um, with a smaller number of chairs for people who may be still anxious about it and want to keep their distance, just feel free. And the, whatever's going on in here in the morning, the speakers and the Bible study will be um, live streamed into um, that room. It's just a little bit more spacious and will allow you to kind of just keep your distance a little bit. Um, they also <clears throat> have very kindly, although this doesn't work for every single meal, but there are grab bags available for lunches. So if you want to grab your lunch and go and eat outside, the weather's looking good this week. Um, so feel free to do that as well, uh, just to try and make sure that this is not quite such a super spreader event. Um, we don't want it to be at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, prayer. Um, so prayer is going to um, form, obviously, a large part of this week. And building from last conference, we have got um, prayer ministry teams available after the, the main worship, which will be, well, now, um, but Compline tonight and then tomorrow afternoon and evening. Um, but um, the prayer area, again, in the main conference hall is being set up for you just to access whenever you like. That's where Shem and Nerf are going to hang out if you want to go and talk to them about anything. Um, it, and I think a number of people as well have been signed into doing intercession throughout the conference. So we have prayer going on in various different forums. We also um, have a number of different people who are coming um, just, just to, I suppose, kind of a, a well-being thing. We've got Peter Macriel who's going to be doing counselling. Um, Sign-up sheets for all the workshops, by the way, are on the windows as you go along the glass area between here and um, the, the bar. So sign up for workshops, but um, for, for counselling um, and chaplaincy, there are sign-up sheets there where you don't need to put your name, you can just put a cross um, and then... Um, Peter Macriel will be hanging out in the Cromford room, which is a little bit hard to find, but it's in the lakeside area next to whoever's in room 232. It's next to your bedroom. Yeah, so that's, that's the area that you're heading towards because you've got to hunt it down a little bit. Simon Clift, who is an occupation therapist, will be coming on site tomorrow as well if you want to book in to see him. And the nurse, Maddie, is going to be um, available. Is it from now? 
yeah, so she's um, off the marketplace um, and you're doing blood pressure and that kind of thing. Apparently, last conference, she saved two people's lives by doing blood pressure. So, oh, <laughs> well, so, too modest, yes. So do make use of her as well. Um, the other thing as well is just to be aware that there will, people, will be people who've come um, on this week who are feeling tired possibly because they have had COVID and are struggling with long COVID. And just to, just to uh, affirm that you do not have to come to absolutely everything. You take this at your pace. You come to what you want to. Um, this is not a marathon. Um, is that the right word? A sprint? Yeah. So take the time out when you need it, basically. Do not push yourself beyond what you need to do. This is for rest as well as uh, refreshment and restoration. So I think that's all the things I needed to say. So, does that give you enough time to write it, Bishop Mark? Thanks, Emma. One of the key differences between me and Bishop Sam is that Bishop Sam does write it in the five minutes beforehand, but sounds like he hasn't, whereas I don't, but sound like I have. <laughs> well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you open your word to our hearts and would you open our hearts to your word, we pray, because we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. So yesterday morning, there were these two coppers. This is a genuinely true story. They were standing by their motorcycles and they looked horrified as two apparently hairy bikers walked up in their leathers to speak to them and the other biker said to them, you'll never guess who we are. We are the Lord Mayor of Chester and the Lord Bishop of Chester. <laughs> And we genuinely were, because yesterday morning I did what I've never done before, which was to take a Sunday morning completely off at the invitation of the Lord Mayor of Chester and ride with about 500 other motorcyclists in a sponsored bike event for most of the day to raise money and publicity for the hospice, Good Shepherd Hospice, just outside Chester. And it was an extraordinary day. Absolutely loved it. That's not the reason for the beard, but it did come in helpful. So at about nine o'clock in the morning, we turned up at a pub on the edge of Christleton. Um, uh, there were probably about six or 700 because a number of people were riding pillion as well. All of us there in our leathers, bacon sandwich was on, loads of tea and coffee. Uh, everybody could tell what we were there for because when bikers turn up, you know that bikers have turned up. It was a deeply refreshing morning. I have to say, there is something about that for me when I come to Mark chapter 1. It's not only because it has the best of the four names of the Gospels that I love the Gospel of Mark. It's that Mark has no messing around, no hanging around, no kind of doubt about what he is about. The very first words of the very first line of the Gospel of Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark dives in. He cannot wait to communicate this message that he has. And when Jesus appears on the scene, I was going to say on the screen, I don't think he's going to appear on the screen. When Jesus <laughs> appears on the scene in verse 14, again, he becomes proclaiming the good news of God. And I love the fact that there is no messing, he's straight into it. Cut Mark any which way, and what you will find is that he is all about Jesus, and he is all about the good news of God. And kind of that's what I want to say to you this afternoon. If you cut the Diocese of Chester any which way, what do you find that we are all about? And let's make this just a bit more personal. If you, I mean, please don't, this is a metaphor, not literal, but if you cut any one of us, any which way, <laughs> what do you find that we're all about? I spent six mostly very happy years as the principal of a TEI. I was warden of Cramner Hall in Durham. And one of the things that really struck me was that almost every ordinand we sent out could answer that question. They knew what they were being ordained for. They were passionate about Jesus. Wouldn't always use that language depending on their ecclesiological tradition, but they were passionate about Jesus. But actually see people 10 years later and the burdens of ordained ministry 
begin to put all sorts of other things very firmly on the agenda. You've probably heard me say this because I make this joke often and people wince because of the truth of it. Jesus had two priorities in the scriptures, always just had two priorities. And they were really clear. And I'll tell you what they were. They were decent coffee and paying the parish share. (laughs) And the reason that joke works is because it's frighteningly close to the truth, isn't it? Friends, if you cut us any which way, what are we really about? Because it doesn't matter whether you are the highest person here or the lowest person here, the youngest or the oldest, the most black, the most white, the person with the lowest IQ, the person with the highest IQ, the person who's been to 347 clergy conferences or the person who doesn't quite know why they are at this one. If we are not centred on Jesus, we are nothing at all. And you can translate that into your own traditional language. But if we are not centred on Jesus, we are nothing at all. Because we were not ordained to be social workers, although there's a lot of social work that we do because of being ordained. We were not ordained to be counsellors. We were not ordained to be this, that, or the other. We were ordained to follow in the footsteps of the one who bursts onto the scene, and onto the screen probably, proclaiming the good news of God. And I noticed two things about that. Firstly, it is good news, and the second thing is it's about God, not about the church. And I don't know what your experience is, but when I arrive in a new place, I may well have asked you this, I almost always go around to people saying, tell me how you met Jesus. And what I find in the Church of England is that people say, "Um, well, I can tell you how I started coming to church. And I go, that's a great start, that's brilliant. And when did you start meeting Jesus? Because if you haven't met him yet, could we have a conversation? Jesus appears on the scene proclaiming he has something to bring to the party. The good news, because it is the best news of God. And it might be that that is all we need to hear in these three days, but we need to make sure we hear it in the tone that Mark offers it, not the tone that we will sometimes find ourselves receiving these things. Do you know there are two very similar words in the New Testament? They are conviction and condemnation. (laughs) Conviction and condemnation. Bless you. I feel very qualified to say that. Bless you. (laughs) Conviction and condemnation. And they come to us in a really similar way often because we will discern that something is out of kilter. It might be a big thing or a small thing. And almost always, those two things happen at the same time, but they have different sources. Because when something is out of kilter, the Holy Spirit will sit down alongside us and whisper in our ear. And sometimes, if we're not listening, he'll stand in front of us and bellow into our face so that we can hear. But nevertheless, he says kindly, will you listen? We need to get this sorted. There is something in the way, and let's sort it out in order that you can come back, in order that you can be free, in order that you can live the life of the kingdom, in order that you can be all I am calling you to be. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of conviction is restored intimacy with the Father. It is holiness, it is grace, it is peace, it is forgiveness, it's life. But the problem is, at the same time, condemnation will also be whispered by the enemy, by the prince of this world. And he, or in this politically correct age, maybe I should say she. That was meant to be funny. (laughs) Won't say, come back. He will say, you're a dirty, rotten toe rag. You pretend to be holy, but everybody looks at you and sees. How can you possibly look for forgiveness? And you know this because it will whisper in your heart just as it whispers in mine. And the fruit of condemnation is that you are driven away from grace, not to grace. But Paul is very clear that there is no place for condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when I talk about us being those who, whichever way you cut us, you will find us around the good news of God in our Lord Jesus Christ, I don't say it in order to beat you up, because I would be first in the queue for needing to be beaten up. It's not condemnation. 
It's rather that invitation to say those who are thirsty, come to the waters and drink. Those who find themselves thinking, I used to be like that when I left college, actually can come back to the dance and find yourself being invited onto the dance floor again. You can find yourself coming back saying, Lord, restore to me the joy of my first love because I remember that glorious liberty of the children of God and I want to come back to you again. And if this conference is about no more than that, it will be more than worth it. Jesus appears proclaiming the good news of God. I want to just spend a little bit of time in verses 14 and 15 and then make two observations on the rest of the passage because otherwise bishops Julie and Sam will punch me quietly because I won't leave anything for them to say. I love verses 14 and 15 of Mark chapter 1. Every word is worth preaching on. Second half of, uh, sorry, beginning of verse 15. Jesus says the time is right. Literally, literally, the kairos. You sometimes hear people preaching about the kairos moment. The kairos is ripe, is fulfilled, is ready. It's ready for God to be at work even when we do not know what we are doing. The time is ripe Why? Because God is nearby. Have you noticed this formulation of the gospel, this way of expressing the good news that Mark has? For it seems to me in a post-COVID, post-modern generation, there is something deeply profound about the way that Mark expresses this. How does he start explaining what the good news is? Well, he goes right back and says, I have not come to bring you a formula. I've not come to teach you a method. I've not come to teach you a new religion or necessarily a specific new way of doing things. If you want to know what my good news is, it's this. God is just around the corner. And if you will but open your eyes, you can be in on meeting him when he turns up in the room. God is at hand. The kingdom of God is about to break in. God is doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Friends, many of us post-COVID find ourselves wondering how we are going to continue doing what we have been doing. And whilst that is deeply frightening, I have to say to you, I think that is also deeply exciting because the gospel has never been about a formula. It's been about a person. We are called to be those who are not called to a profession in that sense of uh, coming in to do things one step after another, but rather to be followers. Those who profess in the sense of professing faith. We are called to be those who bet our lives that Christ will turn up, otherwise we will look complete and utter wallies. We are called, literally, to bet our whole lives that this good news is true because God is at hand. And when God turns up, everything looks different in ways that we cannot predict or foretell, but we know that things look different. The time is ripe because God is at hand. And so what do I want you to do? I want you to repent, says Jesus. And here we bump into another problem. Because we are very fixed in the way that we understand that word, And I have to say to you, I think therefore we rob it of much of its impact, and that's a problem. I think it's true culturally, and I think it's true linguistically. If I say to you, repent, then you immediately, well, maybe you don't, but I immediately think of somebody on Oxford Street or somewhere uh, around with a sandwich board saying, repent, the Lord is nigh. I don't know where nigh comes from, but that's what seems to be on the board. I want you to feel dreadful about yourself and fall down weeping. And the problem is that people are not looking for that as good news because it doesn't connect with where they are. There's a book by a chap called Jason Georges, or perhaps it's French, or maybe it should be Georges, I don't know. But the book's called The 3D Gospel, and it looks at the gospel through the book of Ephesians. And in that, he writes this. Christian missiologists identify three responses to sin in human cultures. Guilt, shame, and fear. These three moral emotions have become the foundation for three types of culture. Firstly, guilt, innocent cultures, which are individualistic societies, brackets, mostly Western, where people who break the laws are guilty 
and seek justice or forgiveness to rectify a wrong. Do you recognise that? It describes kind of traditional British society, really. Secondly, shame, honour cultures, which describe collectivist cultures which are common in the East, where people are shamed for not fulfilling group expectations, and they seek to restore their honour before the community. And if you think about many stories we hear from Eastern cultures, often from Asian cultures, actually that makes a huge amount of sense when we begin to think of them as shame, honour cultures, rather than guilt, innocent cultures. And thirdly, fear, power cultures, which refers to animalistic contexts, sorry, animistic, I should say, contexts, typically tribal or African, where people are afraid of evil and harm, and so they pursue power of the spirit world through magical rituals. Now, most of us were taught the gospel, if that doesn't sound like a tautology, very much in this guilt-innocence culture. I want you to, I don't know what I'm pointing to you, just have to but I want you to repent because you have done wrong. So you need to make restitution in order that Christ's innocence might come on you. And of course, there's nothing untrue about that. It's deeply and profoundly true, except that the culture that we are living in is more and more confused about whether it regards wrongdoing as being guilt or shame or even fear. Sociologists are beginning to say that we are moving much more towards the shame, honour culture. And actually social media pushes us in that direction really quite profoundly. And if you speak to a certain generation, that's what they talk about. But I have to say to you, I often see when I look at our culture through this lens, the fact that actually our fear power dynamics are growing hugely strong as well as people realise that they cannot control the world, which they were brought up to believe that they could control through their own individualism, through wealth, through uh, technology, and so on and so forth. And that means that if we proclaim repentance purely in a guilt-innocence mode, which is the way that we've been talking about it, we will not only disconnect from the vast majority of people to whom we are talking, but actually we will be rejected by them because it will feel as if we are trying to impose a cultural structure on them which they are not living in. Now, hear me right. I am not for a moment suggesting the gospel as you have been taught it is wrong. I'm saying that we need to learn how to proclaim afresh in every generation the good news that we have received. You might recognize those words. They are deeply precious to us as Anglicans. And when we come back to the text, we find, surprise, surprise, that God has gone before us. Because the word repent means rethink. It means reimagine. It means reconceive. It means be of new mind or be of new understanding. Metanoia. Have a new nous is what it means, or at least a different nous. Or as my grandmother used to say to me, get your noggin sorted out, mate. And in a generation where to say that somebody has done wrong doesn't mean that they have made a mistake, it means to them that they are a mistake, we need to rediscover the good news of this gospel of repentance. Because I am not going to somebody to say, you need to repent because I want to make you feel guilty. I'm saying to you, you need to repent because Christ makes you new and you are not a mistake in Christ. There is a whole new creation which is made possible through Christ's death and resurrection. There is a whole world of possibilities out there because God is near and Christ has opened the way into it. And the key, it's penitence. It's this new birth into new possibilities made ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. I will try to stop getting so excited, but can you see how this matters? And how do you get into it? Well, it's the very next word in Mark's gospel, and I love it in the Greek because it's pistos, which just sounds great to say. <laughs> and again, we religiousize it and rob it of its power because we say, believe, believe, believe as if it were your religious duty, but it isn't. It literally means, well, not literally, but, but basically the sense of it is, you can bet your life upon this. If you want in to this new way of being that Christ opens up, how does it come? It comes by stage diving off of where you are and trusting yourself entirely to his hands. It comes from committing yourselves into an unknown future where you have no idea where Christ is going to lead you, how you're going to pay the parish share, where you'll be doing this, that, or the other. And in this post-COVID generation, 
where heating bills are going up at a hugely frightening thing and we do not know how we are going to pay it on our clergy stipends, we need to hear this call again. This call to leave our nets and radically follow him. Because the words that follow this introduction are an enacted example of how you respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. And we see it worked out with the 12 disciples. One of the many things I am praying for this conference, and one of the main reasons behind the title for the whole conference, is that we can rediscover that calling which first fired us up when God tapped us on the shoulder and said, do you know, this might sound crazy to you, but I want you to be ordained. Rediscover that passion that we had when we were sent out, when we stood shaking knees as I did before the Bishop of Chester all those years ago, and he said, whatever he said about, do you believe that God is calling you to this? I do. Because this good news is not only still true, it is still good. And you are called to be made new in it. Paul said, was it in Galatians or Colossians? Somewhere in one of his letters. He says, so then, I think it's Colossians, isn't it? He says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue in him. I was going to say something about strategy, but I think I'm going to run out of time and it's kind of off topic, so we'll come back and talk about that again. But we're going to start a strategic thing in the diocese coming up. But I do just want to say one other thing, which is to say, please notice in this passage that the enacted response that I've just talked about is then worked out corporately. The first actions of Jesus in the synoptic Gospels, and you see it most clearly here in Mark where it's all condensed, are that he comes, he proclaims, and then he calls. And anybody who tries to separate those, I would argue, just doesn't understand the flow of the scriptures. That He proclaims, and then he calls. I'm not going to say much about the calling, except to note that they must go together. Because this gospel ministry was never intended to be done alone. I do believe one of our key strategic mistakes, and I don't believe I'm going to be able to rectify this, even in the Diocese of Chester, but one of our key strategic mistakes is that whereas Jesus sent everybody out in a minimum of twos, we send everybody out as ones, and then we wonder why people get lonely and burnt out. And one of the things we need to get much better at is actually the whole sense of how do we build local team in a way that works with lay and ordained ministry. But one thing that I am deeply conscious of, and forgive me if this sounds at all um, uh, kind of self-centered to share with you, is as a church, we radically lack what you might call middle ground polity. I was thinking about this on the ride yesterday, because I don't know if you've ever ridden with 500 motorcyclists, and some of you have probably never ridden a motorcycle, but actually, when you go out riding around Cheshire, the joy is just having the freedom of the open road. And whilst, of course, certain motorcyclists like me never, ever break the speed limit, that was also meant to be fun. <laughs> riding with 500 bikes or so, you find yourself riding along roads where you would normally be doing 55 miles an hour at 25 miles an hour. And you see a bike coming up in your mirror, and your instinct is to move over because you know they're a crazy loon who want to whip past, and then you remember that, no, you're riding together. And then the person in front of you brakes when you wouldn't have broken, broke, you know what I mean, <laughs> applied the brakes, slowed down. And your instinct is to think, Wally, what did you, or some word like that, what did you break for? Because riding together is hard. When the Diocese of Chester was formed at the Reformation, we comprise what is now the Diocese of Chester, the Diocese of Manchester, the Diocese of Liverpool, the Diocese of Blackburn, the southern half of the Diocese of Carlisle, and the western half of the Diocese of Leeds. And there was one bishop. And the bishop used to get on his horse every so often and ride up to Kendal or across to Ripon, both of which were in the Diocese of Chester, and literally hold court. And then the clergy would breathe a sigh of relief because they knew they wouldn't see him again for another three or four years. <laughs> We've radically changed the way that the church is. My files in Bishop's House are still quite literally full of emails which have come into the Bishop's office, which Muriel, bless her, has printed out, and Bishop Peter has written in ink pen his reply before Muriel has typed it up and sent it back to you. 
I live in a world where I have mobile phone, where I try to respond to emails, where we are available and around. But there are almost 300 parishes in this place. And we don't know how to do the middle ground polity, that kind of organisation of self, but we know that we want it. And one of the things I want to urge uh, from you and beg from you, really, is that we practice the disciplines of trust and of sheep keeping short accounts with each other as we learn what it is to be the Church of England in the 21st century. Friends often say to me, what do you think your key task of being a bishop is? And I'll give them lots and lots of answers, and the first one is always about Jesus. But one of them, I have to say, is I think it's working out what it means to be a bishop in the 21st century. Because I don't think we actually know how to do it in a way that means we are doing this stuff together. But I'll tell you this, unless we learn how to do it together, and I don't think it's all about me, incidentally, I think it's actually about how we relate to each other, we can't hope to transform the Diocese of Chester, which is our commission. There are 1.65 million people in the diocese, which means one and a half million people roughly will go to bed tonight without knowing that this is good news. That's our task. And we can only do it together. How? I don't know. But I'm betting my life upon the fact that Jesus does, and that we are called to do it together. So in these days, let's come back with each other to the one who is our hope, our direction, our inheritance, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, and the one who calls us forward. Let's do so in deep honesty. Keep this as a safe place where we can weep together and talk about the stuff that's hard, as well as dream together and talk about the stuff that we'd love to do. For this is a massive family meal table, but actually that's what this place is called to be. In those days, Jesus of Nazareth was found walking the streets of Cheshire, of South Manchester, of the Wirral, And he was proclaiming the good news of God. Now's the time, he said. Because God is just around the corner. Pause and imagine. And if you want in, all you have to do is trust. And then buckle in for the ride. Because God is not finished with us yet. God bless you, and God bless each of us in this conference. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Mark. Brilliant start to the, the conference. Um, you are free to go and eat now. I think tea is at 6.45. Oh, no, you're free to do something, and then tea is um, <laughs> at some stage. I can't remember when, but <laughs> just enjoy. 6.30, thank you. Oh, and after that, we've got um, music in the bar from Sarah Beatty, and then back in here um, for Paul Carenzo, who's a comedian. Um, and then back in the bar for Origin, um, a group who are going to keep the music going um, a bit later after that. So just enjoy. <laughs>